Welcome to the Philip May Annual Lecture at UCLA. Uh, for those of you who don't know Philip May, he was actually my mentor and the founder of uh, schizophrenia research at UCLA. Uh, Philip May was really a pioneer in psychopharmacology research. He studied the methodology and carried out a uh, really classical study at uh, Camarillo State Hospitals, uh, Hospital during the 1960s. It was a study which actually uh, identified the important role of antipsychotic drugs in treating schizophrenia. Hi. May was a pioneer in schizophrenia research. He was also an important figure at UCLA. He was the uh, clinical director of the Neuropsychiatric Institute uh, back in the 1970s and 1980s. He then went over and became the chief of staff of what was then the, the Brentwood uh, VA. And while he was at the VA, he actually engineered the uh, joint residency, which still exists today. And he strengthened that affiliation. He was an internationally recognized figure, one of the founders of ACNP and uh, you know, was internationally recognized for his research. It's, it's appropriate to uh, include uh, uh, Dr. Gregory Light, uh, who's a professor at uh, the University of California, San Diego, and also an innovative researcher who was focused on uh, intervention research. Uh, Dr. Light isn't just a, a visiting uh, researcher, but he's also really uh, somebody who's very closely affiliated with our group. Through our MIREC, where uh, uh, Greg is the associate director, we've worked together uh, in uh, innovative approaches to understanding how to treat uh, schizophrenia research over, over the years. Uh, Dr. Light uh, really did his uh, PhD at UCSD, and he's been there ever since. His, uh, he's currently the um, vice chair for psychiatry education and, and training. Uh, and I mentioned he's the associate director of our MIREC. He's well known as both a, a mentor to young researchers and an innovative researcher who's focused on looking at uh, biomarkers, particularly uh, biomarkers in psychophysiology to sort of advance uh, therapeutics in schizophrenia. He has uh, won a number of awards, including the Stanley uh, Bear Award from the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation. And uh, also uh, in 2018, he had uh, the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation uh, considered his recent contribution one of the top advances and breakthroughs in schizophrenia research. So I will uh, now turn things over to uh, Dr. Light, Gregory. Thank you, um, Dr. Martyr, for that terrific introduction. It's um, a great pleasure to be here and an honor to be giving the Philip May Lecture. Um, this background here that I've chosen for, for both my face as well as for the slide actually is from Philip May's house. Um, I was lucky enough to visit May's Landing in Malibu for um, a retreat that was held by Michael Green and others looking at the role of early visual processing in schizophrenia. And so um, in, in preparing for this lecture, I learned a little bit more about Dr. May and his contributions to the field um, and even started to think about at the urging of uh, Jonathan uh, helped some of the stories about like how, how I got to where I, to, to UCSD, what kind of critical moments informed my own research and career. And um, so in, in picking the title, 
Um, I actually wrestled with the title a, a bit in that um, I could use this title, which is a very, um, you know, grand roundsy sort of title. But I also thought about um, titles related to how UCLA investigators have informed my own career and career choices, as well as another title, which is how um, we use beeps and clicks to improve our understanding and treatment of schizophrenia. We'll stick with this, but you might be on the lookout for some of those subtitles as we go through um, the presentation. Um, a lot of the work that I'm going to be showing is work that's been conducted by early career investigators at UCSD, many of whom are still there. Others are, you know, moving on to their own uh, next steps in career, moving on to graduate programs or residency programs, or even faculty appointments uh, uh, in Southern California or elsewhere. So um, in learning a bit about Philip May and his own experiences working in a state hospital, I thought I'd briefly touch upon some of mine, which is where my real interest in schizophrenia began. Um, I was born in Rochester, New York. And while I was an undergraduate student, I got a job at the Rochester Psychiatric Center in the University of Rochester. Um, this was in the early 1990s. And um, the, the the type of work that we were doing was part of a patient characterization study for the Office of Mental Health in New York State, where they wanted to better understand the patient population in the Rochester Psychiatric Center and other um, centers like it in the state hospital system. So this was an era before medical records, an era before we had um, email and all of the charts were big paper stacks um, that had been accumulated over years. And so um, my job was to go through the hospital and interview the patients who were there. I was trained in symptom rating scales, in structured clinical interviews, and my job was really just to do those um, interviews and try to document it, the, the, the patient population uh, in support of future um, efforts to move them into more community-based care settings. Um, I was lucky that this was a research study and I got to work with three mentors from the University of Rochester, Steve Schwartzkopf, um, shown here in the black and white photo was my primary mentor. Steve Silverstein um, and Steve Lamberti were also uh, critical faculty mentors in this experience. And um, we had set up an EEG laboratory in the Rochester Psychiatric Center as a, as a side, as an add-on project to try to better understand auditory system dysfunction in schizophrenia and whether um, these kinds of tools of neuroscience could be used in some way to help us better understand the patient population. Um, at about the same time, uh, Michael Green, uh, a, a colleague I know that you all know uh, at UCLA, um, wrote a critical paper published in 1996 in the American Journal of Psychiatry, um, where he really shifted the, the discussion, in my opinion, about um, what we were doing in schizophrenia research, um, where we were doing lots of characterization of symptoms, but we weren't looking at the determinants of disability. And what Michael's first review really convincingly showed is that the cognitive deficits of schizophrenia, something that are not really part of the diagnostic criteria are some of the most disabling symptoms. And that work was followed up by uh, Michael and other members of the Myrick group to, to really start to question um, if we're not looking at the neurocognitive deficits, um, which we know are key determinants of functioning, are we measuring the right stuff? 
and how do we measure it? And what are the right cognitive domains to measure in schizophrenia? So Michael, if you're out there, I hope I'm not doing a disservice to the work. It was really um, pioneering uh, work and something that influenced my career as well as many others and got me thinking about at the time as I moved into our OMIREC program is how do the EEG tests that we're using, how do they relate to patient functioning? And so what, what Michael's group had, had showed us via those studies and other elegant studies is that um, cognition relates to some of the key disabling symptoms of schizophrenia, particularly the negative symptoms, and that those negative symptoms also directly impact daily functioning. Now we have a lot of treatments available, many psychosocial that are being pursued around the world to try to improve functioning like assertive community treatment, psychosocial rehab, providing housing and vocational support. We have symptom, uh, sorry, we have treatments, antipsychotics and other psychotherapies for targeting the clinical symptoms. But what do we really do about those disabling cognitive symptoms? At, at this time, we don't have any medications that can improve cognition. And we know that cognition directly impacts daily functioning. So um, one of the ideas that has been kicked around in the field a lot is if you can improve cognition, even modestly, maybe those improvements will relate to distal improvements and outcomes that um, are related to daily functioning. But before you could get there, um, we need to better understand how you can reliably measure cognition. And so what Michael Green and Dr. Martyr and other members of the matrix group did um, was start to define criteria for test consideration in building a battery, a test battery for assessing cognition. And um, this battery, the matrix consensus cognitive battery has become a gold standard test battery for schizophrenia research. And through their um, process, they had identified five criteria essential for test selection, that the measure had to be reliable. It had to be suitable for use as a repeated measure. It had to be related to things that we care about and maybe sensitive to pharmacologic and other interventions. The tests also had to be practical and tolerable by patients, even patients who were severely symptomatic or um, had, had poor functioning. And so um, we then, this paper and the work that followed started to inform our own work about the EEG biomarkers that we were beginning to, to use in the lab. So when I, when I left the Rochester Psychiatric Center, my mentor, Steve Schwarzkopf, the, the person in the black and white photo, um, I had stayed in touch with him at conferences while I was a student. And he gave me this book, Attention and Brain Function, written by a Finnish uh, psychologist, cognitive neuroscientist, Risto Naatman. And um, it, uh, he was really intrigued by this measure that Risto had described in his book based on really an entire career's worth of study in um, Finnish undergrads. And that work was beginning to be applied to neuropsychiatric patient populations. Um, so the, the work that I've primarily will talk about today is an EEG test called mismatch negativity. And I was really lucky to get to meet Risto and even contribute to his second version of the book uh, that does describe more of um, how this measure is impaired across different neuropsychiatric conditions. 
this is a book that's freely available. It's open source, Oxford Press. And um, I, I'm really happy about it because I think that was really the last um, kind of scientific work that um, Risto had, had put out. So I was really pleased to be able to, to, to help him with that final book, marking his career. Um, notably, um, this measure, just as an aside, um, I wrote the foreword to the book describing Risto's journey and Risto had collected some EEG data in the 1960s at UCLA. And so this measure that I'm gonna be talking about that informed Risto's work also started at UCLA, I think in 1967 or 68, working with a professor, I think Donald Lindley, I believe his name was. And so Risto took those e paper EEG tracings. He took a Greyhound bus across the country where he caught a ship to, I think, England. And on that ship, he typed out on a typewriter his dissertation. And that served as the really the foundation of his work and my work and many others that followed. So what is this EEG measure that I, I'm talking about, mismatch negativity? It is a, a passively elicited EEG measure. So um, tones are presented rapidly and occasionally some of those tones differ and they can differ in any um, dimension, be it the duration of the sound, the pitch of the sound, the location of the sound. And we separately record those EEG responses to the standard or frequently presented stimuli as well as those oddball stimuli. And here's, here's an example of what they might sound like. Hopefully this will, we tested it, hopefully it will work. So you can hear occasionally some of the sounds are a little different. In this case, we're using uh, uh, oddball tones that are chirps or whistles. And um, regardless of the tone type, you get, you evoke these standard looking waveforms, the red to the frequently presented stimuli, the blue to the oddball stimuli. And what we want to do is subtract out some of those obligatory EEG components that are just related to hearing a sound to more purely isolate um, a change detection process. So not, it's not just that you're hearing something, it's that your brain is able to detect changes in this ongoing stimulus stream. And when we do that, we see that there's a negative going wave that peaks between 100 and 200 milliseconds following an oddball tone. Um, and because it's a negative going wave and it's thought at the time it was thought to reflect this mismatch comparison process, this echoic memory trace effect, they called it a mismatch waveform and because it's negative and negativity, so mismatch negativity. Um, Risto did lots of studies with this measure demonstrating that it's largely automatically elicited. You don't have to do anything to, to get it. Everybody has a mismatch, whether you're aware of it or not. And you can measure this, this wave in sleeping babies, in mice and rats, in patients with um, neurodegenerative disease. You can even get it in people who are comatose, but subsequently regain consciousness. So it's a really cool measure that reflects the earliest stages of information processing, a pre-attentive form of information processing even. This waveform is followed by a positive going wave that I might mention a little bit in the talk called the P3A component, also automatically elicited um, and reflecting a slightly later stage of information processing, but all still related to your brain's ability to detect um, changes in an ongoing stimulus stream. Patients with schizophrenia have robust deficits in both mismatch negativity and P3A, 
um, on the order of about a 0.9 to 1 standard deviation effect size difference relative to healthy non-psychiatric comparison subjects. Oops, sorry. So one of my first studies with mismatched negativity was actually funded by a MIRAC um, pilot grant called a PALA Award um, set up by Drs. Martyr and Green. And so at the time, we wanted to merely look to see, um, does this measure, um, do patients with schizophrenia show deficits in this measure? And following Michael Green's work, what are the functional consequences of this pre-attentive automatically elicited EEG component? And what we found was a striking correlation that this squiggly waveform that is evoked a 20th of a second after a sound becomes odd um, accounts for about 40% of the variance in patients' psychosocial functioning, first measured via GAF scores and then later via other measures. And moreover, if you plot the topography of that correlation across the scalp, um, it is present and most related in the areas on the scalp where patient deficits are also largest and has this nice topographic gradient in terms of um, the relationship. Um, that work has been replicated by many groups, including by Jonathan Wynn and Michael Green's group at UCLA where they extended it beyond GAF and looked at um, relationships between mismatch negativity and work functioning, independent living, social functioning, and family functioning. And very uh, cool, they got it on the cover of biological psychiatry. And I think from this work here, the measure really started to take off even further as a potentially viable EEG tests that could be informative for understanding schizophrenia and some of the pathways to psychosocial and functional disability across multiple domains. And other groups started to come up and even argue that, or not argue, actually show empirically that this EEG test is even a stronger indicator and correlate of functional outcomes than some of the common neurocognitive tests or theory of mind tests. Also notably, I think um, Dr. Lee also spent some time working at UCLA with uh, John Wynn and Michael Green and may have taken some of the lessons learned back to um, Korea where he set up his own um, well-established EEG laboratory and they're doing uh, amazing work in, in Korea, extending this with large sample sizes. We also found um, in some of those early studies, again, funded off of a pilot grant, this wasn't something I thought I would be spending my career on. This was just an unexpected finding and a thread that we started to pull on. We found that um, the P3A component, that's the wave that followed mismatch negativity was also correlated with lots of cognitive test performances and, and even accounted for about half of the variance in immediate um, verbal recall and delayed verbal recall as well. And so now we're starting to piece together this story that um, these pre-attentive EEG measures have robust relationships to cognition and to daily functioning. Um, I was lucky to also work with a graduate student at UCSD, Carol Jashan, and Carol's dissertation work um, was uh, focused on looking at these EEG biomarkers across the course of illness. And what Carol found is she replicated ours and many other groups finding that patients with chronic schizophrenia have impairments in these measures but she also found that patients with a recent onset of psychosis, as well as even kids who are at high clinical risk, show significant reductions in mismatch negativity. 
and that you could map the topography of deficits across the scalp, lending some um, confidence in this. Now this work of using EEG biomarkers um, across the course of illness, and even for predicting which kids go on to develop psychosis has been extended most recently in a study by the Accelerating Medicines Partnership for Schizophrenia, which has funded um, an international study of kids at high clinical risk being led by Carrie Bearden, Scott Woods, and others, Carrie Bearden at UCLA. And what we will be doing in this study is, among other measures, neuroimaging, um, symptom rating scales, cognitive tests, we will be looking to see whether in a very large cohort of these kids, whether EEG biomarkers in at risk predict which kids go on to develop psychosis. This will also be a large um, internationally available open access data set that I think will be mined for many, many years to follow this PRONET Accelerating Medicines Partnership data set. Okay, so following the, um, the, 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 the matrix process, where now that we're interested in using these tools of neuroscience um, as biomarkers, maybe we should think about what, are, what makes a good bi biomarker. What are the criteria that we would wanna use um, if we wanna extend these tests out into use in clinical settings in um, large scale multi-site trials like the PRONET accelerated medicine trial I just described. And so we took a lot of the same criteria that Green, Martyr and others had defined from the matrix, which is the measures have to be reliable. If they fluctuate or vary wildly from test to test, we're not gonna be able to use them in any um, convincing way um, to, to measure changes in those biomarkers. They should also be use, suitable for use as a repeated measure, meaning that there's no practice effects, maturation effects, instrumentation, or other things. Like with the cognitive tests, we think that these measures should also be related to things that we care about. They should be related to clinical cognitive and functional outcomes. Whoops, sorry about that. Um, Perhaps they would show sensitivity to single or even limited doses of pharmacologic um, agents, even single or extended dose to cognitive training, which I'll show you a little bit about. And they should also be use scalable so that we could use them in real world multi-site global clinical trial settings. Now this, this work is, is where I've spent a lot of my career on and I won't, um, go into too much about the, the foundational studies that we did in the psychometrics, but I will say that the test retest reliability is about uh, 0.9. Um, it's suitable for use, and we've used these EEG tests in different contexts, different settings, different applications, even in uh, fighter pilots who are undergoing other perturbations like hypoxia. Okay, so um, one of the first, maybe the first multi-center um, use of uh, mismatched negativity was done by our consortium on the genetics of schizophrenia. Um, in this study, we were able to collect data from a large sample of 877 schizophrenia patients and 753 control subjects. And we published the initial finding in 2015. And this work was extended by our colleagues at UCSD, uh, Salk and UCSD, Claudia Lanskik, where she applied novel um, analytic methods to EEG analysis. And what you see in this upper figure is actually every individual subject's mismatch negativity and P3A, amplitude color-coded, so that blue is more negative, red is more positive. And in the um, bottom half 
of the screen here are the normal non-psychiatric comparison subjects. The upper portion is the schizophrenia patients. And you can see two things, that the blues are a little less blue and the reds are a little fainter, but also that's one. And the other is that there's tremendous um, heterogeneity in responses where some patients have normal looking responses, others have more significant um, reductions. And that variability has been our friend because it allows us to start to partition the variability and to try to understand and extend that Michael Green model of cognition to clinical symptoms to functional outcome to first, now with this large data set, determine whether measures of early auditory information processing are actually useful. Do you need them? Do they add any explanatory power even to this information processing cascade model? And if so, how do they relate? And what can we do with the information once we have it? So Michael Thomas, a statistician who is in our group and is now faculty member at Colorado State University, um, applied structural equation modeling to this large data set, looking at different domains of cognitive functioning, negative symptoms, and functional outcome, as well as our EEG tests of early auditory information processing. And to put it together and simply, he replicated the findings that our EEG tests were related to cognitive functioning, that they're also related directly to functional outcomes, that cognition is related to clinical symptoms, particularly negative symptoms, and that those cognitive and negative symptoms are also related to functioning. Um, and you can simplify that model further to show that these early auditory information processing um, effects um, and that are, are critical on the pathway to functioning. The other thing that we did with this is now once we have this uh, modeling, we can test the idea. What if you could move the EEG test by one unit or one microvolt? The idea is that that should support um, an improvement in cognition. According to the model, a one microvolt change should result in a pretty large effect size improvement in cognition. And we've done some studies to show that you can move EEG, this mismatch negativity test around. In a, one of our early proof of concept studies, we showed that the drug memantine or Nemenda, a drug that's commonly used for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease, can also significantly, though modestly enhance mismatch negativity in schizophrenia patients and um, healthy controls not shown in this slide. Um, what we demonstrated is acute sensitivity or single dose, one pill malleability. Now we know that even if that was one microvolt, that a, a single pill is not gonna make somebody smarter. It's not gonna result in a large scale improvement in cognition or in their daily functioning. It's not like they're gonna suddenly go back to work, get a job or complete their educational experience, that there's something else that is gonna be required to move um, functioning for our patients. And we don't know yet what is the time course and the requirements for change, but we're thinking maybe cognitive training could help bridge that gap and help us move, make changes from across the entire pipeline here from early auditory processing out to cognition, symptoms, and functioning. So I didn't have any prior experience with cognitive training, but our group um, learned of some of the work from Melissa Fisher, Christine Holland, Mike Merzenich, and Sofia Vinogradov that they were conducting at UCSF. And this was actually first introduced to me at one of our MyRec retreats. I didn't know anything about it, uh, but was really intrigued. And I noticed when I looked it up that they had even um, cited some of the findings that reduced mismatch negativity is associated with 
lower verbal learning and memory performance and poor psychosocial functioning. And what's interesting about this particular approach to cognitive remediation or training is that it's specifically designed to sharpen the accuracy and fidelity of auditory information processing, the things that we were good at measuring. And so um, their idea is that this is a bottom-up kind of training the changes within the neural substrates that subserve early perceptual processing, again, the things that we're pretty good at measuring, feed forward to enhance higher order cognition, including attention, working memory, and verbal learning and memory. And so we started to dig in and wanted to do more with this form of cognitive training. Um, just briefly, it's computer-based. Um, it capitalizes on neuroplasticity-based learning mechanisms that are intact in schizophrenia, and they place progressively greater demands on higher order cognitive domains. And there were some findings, again, that I showed you that shows efficacy for improving cognition in patients at the group level. The entire suite of exercises that we use, we just followed Sofia Vinogradov's group's recommendations, included a uh, suite that starts from making discrimination among sweet sounds like whistles to um, uh, syllable discrimination to making rhythmic judgments and matching uh, uh, and all auditory based and it starts at the lowest level sweeps so i'll give an example of how the sweeps works quickly um, and note that um, before we did it lots of are using it. These are um, findings from Vinogradov's groups, and they've done many studies since. I'll talk about some of the work that we did down at the bottom here, showing that, um, that this form of cognitive training seems to be effective at improving verbal learning and as well as reducing auditory hallucinations in a very impaired treatment refractory group of schizophrenia patients. The, the problem with this form of um, cognitive training is that it's largely been tested in academic labs, it's time intensive, requires resources, and it does not help all patients. So what we wanted to know is can we test the effectiveness of it in a real world cohort? Um, and so what we wanted to, what we aim to study is are these EEG tests acutely sensitive to the neural systems engaged by just one hour of exercises? Again, this is kind of following our work with memantine that a single dose, a single exposure to an intervention might move the system. We also wanted to know is does the 30 hours of the training actually work in this very real world treatment refractory patient group? And do, do changes any or EEG measures at the beginning of treatment, do they predict therapeutic outcomes three months later? In other words, do the EEG changes following initial exposure to the treatment predict which patients benefit? So here's a little bit about the task. The, the subjects are instructed. There's nice videos available for instructing how to, how to follow it, but subjects are instructed to listen for an up sweep and a down sweep. And just, uh, I'll give an example of what they sound like. That's an up sweep, so they'd hit the up arrow for that. That's a down sweep, they'd hit the down arrow for that. And uh, the way these exercises work is they're paired and they have to hit what the up arrow based on whether they heard an up or a down in pairs. So a correct response here would be up, up. And if you get it correct, you move to a more difficult level um, where the sweeps become faster. So that would be a down up. And then if you get really good at this, the sweeps become really difficult to discriminate. Um, doing well requires your full concentration and you even have to replay it back in your mind a bit to, to repeat it. Now I can't actually hear this. So if you have a hard time discriminating, don't worry only the undergrads in the lab can actually make this last discrimination. 
I'll play it again. People usually don't get a second chance, but I'll play it again. So again, I have no idea what that is. It's a, it's a different form of dog whistle for me. My brain is not fast enough to process that. Okay, so our first set of findings is, um, are the measures acutely sensitive to the neural systems engaged by just one hour of the exercises? And what Veronica Perez, a former MIREC fellow found is that um, first, the, the EEG amplitude itself was correlated with the amount of perceptual learning that takes place over the course of one hour of the treatment and that there are changes after one hour in both the EEG measure as well as the source contributions to the EEG. So I didn't talk much about this, um, but um, EEG measured at the scalp represents a variable mixture of contributions from a distributed network of sources. And what Veronica found as part of this kind of source level deconstruction is that there are a couple of sources that seem to account for some of the changes in mismatch negativity after one hour of training. These are sources from the anterior cingulate and orbitofrontal cortex. And in the waves in the middle panel here, you can see that after training, there's a reduction in the contribution of the ACC um, and um, the OFC stays roughly the same. So what we have is some reorganization of cortical networks of an automatic kind of hardwired EEG response reflecting change detection. And so we were really intrigued by this malleability and wondered if um, next, if this treatment actually works after 30 hours in this more refractory group and whether those EEG changes predict benefit. So in a relatively small sample of subjects 24 who got three months of the cognitive training versus 22 who had treatment as usual, um, I wanna point out that the patients were on pretty significant doses of um, antipsychotics. This is a, a group that is court mandated to stay at this long-term locked care facility. Typical length of stay was anywhere from six months to 24 months. They had been ill for a very long period of time and they had significant cognitive impairments as measured by the matrix consensus cognitive test battery. So what we found is like Vinogradov's group is that even in this highly symptomatic, highly impaired treatment refractory group that um, cognition could be improved. In particular, it was in the domain of verbal learning. So in the um, we x-axis here, we have subjects tested at baseline and then three months later, the orange bot line is the cognitive training group, the blue group is treatment as usual, and that was a significant effect and larger than we actually expected. That this group who is most impaired seemed to, to really benefit. It's not a full normalization, however. Patients still have cognitive deficits in verbal learning. We also found to our surprise that there was a significant reduction in auditory hallucinations in this group. Now the auditory hallucinations were a little bit higher at the beginning, not significantly higher in the TCT group and they got a little lower at post-treatment but it's still a non-trivial effect size and something we were intrigued by. Uh, Juan Molina, a, a current uh, CDA recipient working in our group, also found from the same cohort that patients with schizophrenia have impairments in their ability to discriminate speech sounds in noisy backgrounds relative to control subjects, and that the speech and noise discriminability is normalized um, in the TCT group and doesn't improve in the treatment as usual group. Um, this is um, one of those tests that is directly related to the kind of things that the treatment is targeting, right? Like it's an auditory based treatment that's um, designed to improve the accuracy of sound processing. And here we have like an actual functional normalization of that with actual real world speech sounds. 
So we're really excited about this one as well. Um, okay, now the biomarkers, we observe that malleability, as I mentioned, after one hour, also now replicating that in a separate cohort of this long-term locked group. And we found again that um, the changes in verbal learning um, from pre-testing, sorry, to post-testing um, were predicted by changes in the EEG amplitude. In other words, our EEG changes measured at the outset of treatment predicted verbal learning benefit at um, the end of treatment. Juan Molina in the same group um, also found that a similar effect on the auditory hallucinations. He used a different EEG test. This is a measure of the auditory steady state gamma band response. And he found that changes in positive symptoms with the treatment, sorry that my headers are a little bit cut off. The blue group is the cognitive training group. The red group over here is the treatment as usual group. The changes in gamma power after one hour of sweep training predicted the amount of reduction in positive symptoms after 30 hours of treatment. So to put this together, our idea is um, to take our existing model, where if you have an intervention, everybody gets the intervention, um, it can be a pill. Some people are gonna benefit from it and some people do not. So in this cartoon, the blue people are the ones who are sensitive to the intervention. The people um, shaded in the black are not. And you can't tell just by looking at them at the beginning of treatment as to who's gonna benefit. Our new model is maybe we can screen for the biomarker up front so that we can identify up front the people who we think are most likely to benefit and then only give um, the intervention to those who are sensitive to it or the ones we think are most likely to benefit. And so we have several trials in the lab going on right now designed to, to look at that. And uh, we have some new studies getting started where we're combining um, memantine with cognitive training, uh, pharmacologic augmentation of cognitive training. And we hope that this work will contribute to future studies where we can infuse the tools of neuroscience, EEG biomarkers, for example, among others, that might be useful for helping us identify which patients are most likely to benefit from a treatment so that we can give it to those patients. So I mentioned a little bit about some of our ongoing studies, pharmacologic augmentation of cognitive training. Um, we're continuing to, to work with um, translational neuroscience um, to um, see how these measures, I didn't talk about it, um, relate and how you can improve the homology in model systems from mouse to rat to human um, and look at homology of response to different kinds of pharmacologic interventions across species. I mentioned a little bit about the study that's getting started where we're gonna be measuring the EEG tests um, in kids who are at high clinical risk. Hopefully we'll be able to do more to track the progression of the deficits across the course of the illness. And we have um, advances in computational neuroscience, maybe by taking some of the, the innovative approaches that Jonathan Wynn and others are using at UCLA, we can um, develop more refined tools and improve the sensitivity and specificity of these EEG tests even further to move into biomarker guided assignment to treatments, maybe incorporating these biomarkers in early and later phase clinical trials. And again, ultimately with a goal towards um, assessing early response to interventions so that we can try to um, be more effective in our care of patients with serious mental illness like schizophrenia. So I will stop here and I'd really like to thank um, my colleagues here, 
um, most who couldn't be here, but it's their work that are presented. And um, just say thank you. And if anybody wants to come to San Diego, we do have fellowship positions available. This is where our lab is located, um, right on the beach. And um, I'm just kidding, of course. Um, but we would really love to have um, extend fellowship positions to anybody who's interested. So thank you. Greg, th thanks for a terrific talk. And it sort of makes me more optimistic about uh, what's coming in the future. You, uh, we, we have some questions. One of them is from uh, Joaquin Foster, who's really a, um, a pioneer in studies of the prefrontal cortex. He mentions that the light potential you identify is correlated with attention and is most prominent in prefrontal cortex and is essential for executive function, including working memory. Shouldn't training and executive functions be part of uh, cognitive re rehabilitation in schizophrenia? And wouldn't your potential marker, I mean, mismatch, be a reasonable marker for, for looking at executive function? Yeah, I, I think those are, are really good thoughts in that um, f first about the biomarker is we, we view these as um, probes, like these, these sounds, as probes of the functioning of, of a distributed network. I showed you a couple sources of the nodes in the network, but there are several. And um, as we move into source space, and we, we're learning more about the measures, but we can use them to reliably probe the functioning of a network. And that network does include regions that are essential for executive functioning. So okay. I, do, I do believe that we should absolutely be including executive functioning and other forms of skills training to improve the care of patients. Mm -hmm. um, the, the model that I think is an excellent model is some work that's being done right at UCLA in the aftercare program where um, they have comprehensive psychosocial, pharmacologic, and other kinds of interventions available mm -hmm. in order to provide intensive services to patients. Um, when I was going through my training in the 90s, I, I don't think it was widely appreciated that patients with schizophrenia could improve cognitively or that their functioning could improve. At the time, it was, I think that there was, I don't know that anybody would say this, but that if you had a diagnosis of schizophrenia, that you were essentially destined to a lifetime of uh, board and care facilities, homelessness or incarceration or institutionalization. And we now know that that's not true, that recovery is possible that we can have good outcomes. And so I would really like to underscore that question and that point about including um, more types of training. This was just one thing that we dabbled with that we were intrigued by. But I think if we wanted to really infuse good practices for the care of schizophrenia, it'd be a, a multidisciplinary, multimodal, intensive kind of care approach. Yeah. Um this will probably be our final question. Um, uh, Gil Hoffman, one of our uh, early career faculty members is, uh, you know, thanks you for, for a fascinating talk. He's interested in whether MMN or other auditory processing uh, measures are uh, relate, how, how they are manifest in other psychiatric conditions like uh, autism spectrum disorder. Uh, is it just specific to schizophrenia? Uh, could you talk about that? Yeah, sure. It, um, the answer is it is not specific to schizophrenia, mm -hmm. that you can observe different types of deficits, different patterns of abnormalities across multiple neuropsychiatric patient populations. You can observe it across neurodevelopmental disorders, and even some of the really fascinating work that's been coming out is showing that um, you can measure mismatch negativity in pre-verbal children mm -hmm. and use it to predict which kids go on to develop 
language processing disorders and even dyslexia. So it's a, I, I don't view it as something at all specific to schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. I see it as a measure of kind of general brain function there with, as I mentioned before, lots of contributing sources to it. And um, I think if there's any early career faculty members that are interested in applying this or other measures mm -hmm. to different psychiatric disorders or neuro neurologic disorders, I think it's um, a field that's ripe and a great opportunity. Okay, I think we could squeeze in one last question. Uh, Diane Lee Luxemburg is, and it, it's this issue about what it can predict, has the, the military, are they interested in whether or not it can warn of uh, PTSD or other mental illnesses or other kinds of problems? Yeah, um, I don't think it has been widely used in that context. And so I think there's, um, we had a Myrac retreat joint retreat with CSAM many years ago. And at the time there was only one study with looking at mismatch negativity and PTSD. And it was in um, a di different context, non-military context. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's something with a lot of promise. I don't know whether it's gonna work or how it's gonna work. Um, the military has been interested in using it to predict perturbation in, in pilots who are, you know, maybe having hypoxic events during flight. And so we have some studies going on at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base um, looking at um, the acute effects of hypoxia mm -hmm. on these EEG measures and published a paper earlier this year or late last year showing the effects of hypoxia in military pilots. But as far as I know, there hasn't been too much other work. So I think that's another area that um, could be expanded upon further. You know, there are other questions, I'll send them to you, but uh, thanks so much for uh, a, a terrific talk, Greg. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you so much. And thanks to the audience. I'm, I'm really um, you know, very honored to be able to give the Philip May lecture and to come and, and uh, talk to my colleagues and friends, and I hope to meet new colleagues and friends as a result. So if you do have any other questions or want to reach out, please do feel free. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah.